All right, welcome everyone. Tonight I got uh, Mick and Ed. We're gonna get uh, get rocking on talking about some joint mobility stuff. Uh, I I guess I'll kind of start with um, my history of the joint mobility. Is I started in uh, shortly after the Russian kettlebell thing. Um, I got into uh, what was it called Armax with Scott Hahn, uh, where all the tactics stuff comes from. And I started with uh, Into Flow. Uh, it's kind of where I started in the the other thing I look at is, too, is I split it up into mobility, which is more like range of motion, and joint mobility, which is actually trying to work on the, uh, the actual joints themselves. So that's kind of uh, the splits I have. Um, and then now we're looking at kind of the RPR stuff, which is a little bit different way of attacking mobility. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think of the uh, mobility stuff so far? What's been the biggest benefit? Um, for me... The, the RPR stuff was was game changer. I had, I had seen some of uh, Scott's stuff over over the years, you know, like Grappler's Toolbox and kind of some of that stuff. Um, but the RPR stuff really, really helped me, um, especially when done in conjunction with some of the, like, neural reset stuff and the uh, the joint mobility stuff but um i'd had a little bit of familiarity with sun and stuff but um this is really my first real deep dive into it but it's making a big difference for me cool man Ned, i think yeah. you got a little bit of feedback on your on your mic seems so stuff i don't know Nick, are you hearing the same thing yeah yeah that's right headphone it up yeah <laughs> oh god oh god <laughs> loud noises all right that's why i just came prepared yep that's, that's, that's it cool. yeah yeah so i had i had done a little bit of scott scott stuff like years ago when i was doing more martial arts uh, when we got when I got into like some of the Sistema, mm -hmm. the Russian martial arts stuff, because I think he's involved with some of that as well. Yep. Um, yeah. So I'd seen a little bit of it back then, and then the RPR stuff at first reminds me a little bit of kind of some of the Russian massage stuff that they do within mm -hmm. uh, Sistema as well. Yep. Um, but and just a much more organized system. They kind of figured out like, okay, here's the eight or nine things that make the most difference and kind of just broke it down into a real quick routine that you can do by yourself where you're not. Yeah. It's just easier to kind of get through. Sure. So in, and this is kind of interesting too. Um, you guys may not be familiar with Dan Victor. Um, if you, you guys familiar with Z health? Yes. Yeah. No. So Z health was, so Sonnen and uh, Dr. Eric Cobb, basically had learned a lot of the same joint mobility stuff. And I don't know if they were at one time kind of working on the same stuff, but when you looked at the into flow stuff that Sonnen had, it was head to toe. You looked at the Z health stuff and it was from the feet up. And so Dan Fichter, um, unrelated, he he's been in the Z health stuff and he's kind of explored a lot of that, but he had mentioned that when he does performance, he works from the brainstem out and down and when he works rehab he works from the feet up and right. so i i think that's kind of where the split came from because if you look at z health primarily worked with rehab type um clientele versus sauna was working more with the athletic type of clientele and so i i think that's kind of where a lot of this stuff kind of finally came to and then when you look at the rpr stuff theirs is focused on so level one is basically what we have on the on the team and that is um, pretty much from the inside out is what they're focused on. So you work on the diaphragm and the psoas and things like that and work your way outwards into mm -hmm. level two, level three, level four, um, which I don't even know if level four is out yet. But uh, so level one is, is basically what we hit um, with the diaphragm, the psoas and glutes are kind of the big three on, uh, on level one. And I, I tell you the, uh, the RPR, um, on the clavicle and the armpit complex, 
that helped me a helps me a ton because hmm. um, my shoulders are just so tight um, along with the, the mobility stuff. But like sure. when I'm getting ready to go into a session, an upper body where I'm going to be doing a lot of upper body or like before jujitsu class, that clavicle uh, armpit complex of RPR, man, big difference in my range of motion um, and my ability to, to take some force and, and control it. Um, it really activates those groups, those muscle groups and gets them fired up and opened up. So there's, um, so speaking of Dan Fecker, there's some pretty cool stuff coming out with uh, level three, level four RPR. Um, level two is kind of more specific, you know, Hey, let's hit hamstrings and calves and things like that. Um, a little bit more specific, but three and four is getting into I'm trying to think of how they term it of uh, primal reflexes. So like working on like a bite reflex or a fall reflex to actually improve performance. So it's, it's kind of some cool stuff. It's kind of coming down the pipe. Yeah. I've done some, I was having like uh, hip and back issues couple years ago and went in to got some physical therapy Mm -hmm. and they did a lot of like the PRI kind of stuff, but she also had me doing some stuff like biting down on a, like a tongue depressor, popsicle stick kind of thing. And like you bite on it on the right or on the left side of your mouth and suddenly your hip on the right side moves a whole lot better. You're like, what witchcraft is this? (laughs) So so semi-related to that, um, who was it? I think it was Tony Holler. And Chris Corfis, we're talking about one of their sprinters, uh, really high level sprinter, did really well. You know, he's top of the state. And um, and they're like, you remember when he had hamstring issues? Because they're talking about the RPR stuff um, and RPR leading to almost no soft tissue injuries there. I'm like, remember he had the hamstring issues? And it wasn't like he was straining it or it was an injury, but they're just like he had issues. Um, and, and Chris had mentioned, he's like, oh, yeah, it was right about the time he got braces. And because the braces sure. changed his jaw structure it, it ended up affecting his glutes hmm. or not his glutes, but his hamstrings. So it was kind of a kind of an interesting um, connection there. That's, that's interesting. I, I know you had mentioned uh, in one of our conversations, Cal using that bite therapy, like mid game to get some folks like sideline recovered. Yeah. Um, was it was it soccer team? Yeah, I think Girl it was soccer. soccer. Girls soccer team, like mid game, getting recoveries from that that bite stuff. So that'd be interesting yeah. to see, like the real time work with that. And I know with Chris Chris Corfus, you know, a lot of his athletes. Some people say that athletes, oh, this athlete whines or complains, and I think that comes from coaches who are not very tuned in with their body, like their mm-hmm. entire life. Because a lot of these athletes that he gets are just like, hey, coach, I know something's wrong. I just don't know what it is. And then they come over and he just does a, an RPR reset on them. He's like, hey, I'm good. So they weren't complaining. They were just identifying a lack of performance in their, in their structure. Yeah. And he's able to, you know, on the, at the game, you know, just basically be able to reset them right there and yeah. put them right back in the game. Yeah. Do – um where does, in like your opinion, like I do it very, very little now since I've, I've been on the, on the program with the RPR stuff, I occasionally do it. Um, but, um, where, where does foam rolling fit in, in your opinion with that whole mobility piece? Like, you know, there's people that are like, mm-hmm. oh man, I can't do anything till I foam roll kind of. I, I used to be that guy. right and i've got guys i got guys in in my gym like when they hit the mat before they even finish putting on their gi they're like oh man i gotta hit the foam rollers right and i'll I'll like sometimes use it um but i have found that rpr has given me a much quicker result Mm -hmm. but do you still feel like there's a, a place in the programming for foam rolling in terms of the mobility piece so I think it comes down to everything we do is trying to manipulate the nervous system in some way. And so when it comes to foam rolling and RPR, a lot of it is 
getting the system to relax. A lot of people are just over tense um, and not necessarily tight muscles, but the, the, the nervous system is overactive and it got their muscles uh, tightened up more than what allows performance. So sometimes I think light rolling before a session may help some people. Um, I know that's how I was doing when I did do the foam rolling stuff. I did a lot of that, just kind of light rolling, get the blood flow going, just kind of get the muscle to chill out a little bit. Now I don't really see as much use for it just with the RPR and the mobility and, and like getting everything in alignment. I find I just don't need it as much. Um, every so often I'll use it on the spine just to do a self-adjustment on, on some of the, the vertebrae, just getting those back in place. But I saw that I don't do it a whole lot, but if somebody likes it, it's, it's one of those, as long as they're doing, you know, only a couple minutes, they're not spending 45 minutes, you know, doing soft tissue and prep work or whatever, you know, just they got to get the work done eventually. So it's, it's, right. it's that nervous system reset, I think is the big thing, uh, which RPR helps with so much that you just don't find the benefit with a lot of that stuff anymore. Yeah. I, like I said, I, I've noticed since, since I started doing the RPR, I do very, very little uh, foam roller. I'll still on some days I'll still use a lacrosse ball on my shoulders, yep. like in the door jams and stuff like that. Um, but usually that's on like an off. I actually, I do that on an off day. It, again, it's just like part of a reset. Um, yep. But um, I've, I've noticed, and I've actually passed RPR on to three or four of my folks um, in my gym and they've started using it and nice. sort of the same thing seeing the, the same benefit and some of the history behind it too is i think cal was doing like i don't know if you guys remember the the five minute isometrics hard to forget yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. he would have those on on say like the the dumbbell bench um and he would hit that shoulder clavicle rpr spot while they're in that five minute iso so there's there's some kind of play there too and i think the issue with a lot of the soft tissue foam rolling type stuff is that the point of concentration may not be uh, pointed enough to really get the work done that you want. Right. So, so like, are you really going to affect an IT band that's all fired up? Probably not as much as just hitting a spot on your, you know, above your hip with the RPR is going to get that muscle to relax a lot better. Yeah. It's kind of like that area. Yeah. Like you're saying with the spine stuff, like I, I, I can't reach my spine all that well. Sure. And I find myself with the foam roller and I've even got one of the really knobby ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tend to just hit like my upper back and that sort of area, but it's like two or maybe three days a week. And then I'll kind of hit like the glutes real quick just cause it feels good. Yep. You know, and that's, yeah, typically before I head to the gym or something like that, it's kind of just that like loosen things up a little bit before getting in the car to drive to the gym. Yep. Then when I get there, I just feel like I can, roll into my workout a little bit sooner. I don't feel like I need to do as much kind of like warm up prep stuff. And there's, there may be a benefit to say post-workout or off day workout where you're doing more of a slow controlled kind of thing. What I've transitioned to though, is using the massage gun and just going, I start at the feet and I work my way up on uh, like a Saturday or Sunday uh, and doing a full body, just hitting it with the vibration gun. So to me, I found that a little bit more effective, but for somebody else that doesn't have a massage gun, maybe you just do a, a foam roller. You know, you you hit the entire body over 30 minutes or whatever, just for as a recovery session. Um, there's probably some benefit there. I would prefer people get hands-on massage. I think that's, um, I think there's a lot of stuff there that we don't quite know why it's so effective, but the human connection, hand touch, skin to skin, there's, there's something there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I, I have worked with the massage gun some, but I, we talked in our last chat, like I'm once a month, have my massage therapist come in and just work me over. Yep. And it's the benefits to it are great. Um, again, don't know why, but I, I've tried like the high end, like the super high end massage chairs where they're like compressing and moving you like you're, stuck in the chair i've tried those i've tried massage guns nothing compares to human massage 100 yeah that's actually one th i think of all the things i missed from doing the systema type stuff is they integrated a lot of 
sort of body health work into it. And they did do massage stuff. It was weird. It was dudes walking on you or what they call the ballistic massage, which is basically taking hits. Yep. But yeah, there's still a human connection component to it. And you're, you're getting inputs that you can't normally do on yourself. I think the RPR actually helps a, a lot with that because I noticed especially like the sternum and the bottom of the ribs is where I kind of feel the most benefit. And those were places you kind of got punched a lot in Sistema or if some dude was walking on you. Those were spots where they tended to dig in a little bit more. And yeah, like when I was doing that stuff a lot, I definitely felt like I was, I don't remember having a lot of big injuries in that time period. I did tweak my back a little bit once, but even that I came back from really quick. I think because there was so much of that, you know, twice a week massage, even if it was a beat down, it was still a massage. Right. Yeah. I haven't done a whole lot of the, uh, the system stuff. I did a couple of sessions, but yeah, they definitely have that full inclusive, you know, Hey, let's do some joint mobility. Let's do some, you know, soft tissue work afterwards. It seems pretty full well spectrum. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Kevin Secor up in, where's he out of Ottawa, I think. He sent me a couple of his videos. He sent me some yeah. of his stuff, and that was really my first exposure to him. I think he's taken the Sistema stuff and westernized it enough to where it's not a bunch of fluff. Because he gets right. some of those dudes who are like the no touch, like you know, shenanigans. You're like, come yeah. on, bro! Like seriously, like I get that you're working the psychological aspect of it, but the world doesn't see that. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you can't put that on YouTube. You know. <clears throat> yeah yeah the that's the the problem is is that like some of the stuff that you do for the stem announce, like it, it's given it such a bad name like the early stuff that i saw that i got exposed around was you know it was, <laughs> it wasn't, yeah it wasn't just no touch bullshit yeah, and I think it's interesting having studied Sistema and Aikido. I think they've kind of suffered from the same sort of thing as like as sort of the founders of the art as we see it have gotten older, their style has gotten softer and more flow and yeah, more into that side of things rather than now we're just going to beat the crap out of each other. Mm-hmm. Because Aikido was very much the same way, having trained with people that trained with the founder very early on when he had first started it versus guys that had come from the lineage like post-World War II and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's almost two different styles. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Because, yeah, like our, my main sensei, he had come from you know, like the people he had mostly learned from were from that earlier style. It was hard. Yeah. Like we did hard break falls, hard techniques, and we'd go to other dojos and people were like looking at us like, these guys are nuts. Because we were just like f- throwing each other across the mat, but that's what we were used to. Right. It, it makes you wonder how many martial arts change and shift as as the population gets older and more beat up if they have to change how they train and if one way is better than the other and you i don't know if we know you know maybe it's just kind of a toss-up yeah yeah i think there's there's definitely an aspect of that to it and i think as the art gets bigger and bigger and the people more and more of the people doing it get farther and farther away from actually in a thinking about that i'm gonna have to fight with this Mm -hmm. like legitimately like i mean you know the world's safer today than it was you know post world war ii in terms of walking around contrary to what people think you know right especially if you're a japanese national right um yeah so um you know people just don't think about having to fight with it now like we see the same thing sort of in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right? You see in BJJ, it's so competition focused. There's folks, not everybody, but there's a lot of people that are maybe really competition focused who don't remember that like this thing was 
this art was about like challenge matches in the streets and beaches of Rio. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, now you've got, you've got these kids programs where, you know, <laughs> things like that. And it's like, wasn't that way when I started in 93, it was like, yeah, we're, if this guy punches you, you do this. And everything was, you know, instructors lined up everybody and fought everybody. And there was dojo storms and stuff like that. But. <laughs> right. You, you see the same thing in the fitness industry where for the long time it was, everybody was kind of soft. Like there was hardcore bodybuilding or whatever, but nothing really hard. And then you had a little bit of CrossFit come out and like at the first that wasn't really anything crazy. It was like, go chop wood. Okay. That's cool. You know, functional, whatever. But then the Jim Jones thing came out with uh, the movie 300 and then it was just a competition on who could be harder. And we right. went way off the deep end which then resulted in the swing back the opposite way where everybody got super soft and was super focused on recovery, but they weren't training hard anymore. They were actually under training and over recovering. Yeah. It was like four days a week of recovery work. Yeah. For two days of lifting. Exactly. Right. So I, yeah, and you, I think, yeah, go ahead. You made that post or uh, shared that post the other day talking about that, about under training. And, and what struck me about that was, is like, you know, and, and we're, um, uh, we're in our programming, we're talking about mobility and we're doing all this mobility stuff, but we're all basing it off of that readiness and like where we are in that and where you've got some of these folks that are just like, oh no, I better do my 45 minutes of foam roller before and after, no matter right. what, no matter how I feel. Yep. Um, you know, I've got to do my my yoga mobility thing, and then I'll lift some dumbbells. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Pope. He did uh, an interview on it was, it was like the Human Predator Pack Meal podcast. Him and Craig talking about building the elite and some of their programming. And John was talking about how when he was in college doing baseball, there was a point where he was going in working with a therapist for 45 minutes to an hour before practice going through a full hour to two hour practice. And then, yeah, spending another like 45 minutes to an hour after practice doing a whole bunch of other stuff. He's like, I was training five days or, you know, five, six hours a day and wasn't getting any better. Right. Yeah. Wasn't getting any better in terms of issues he was having or, or performance. Both. Both. Yeah. Yeah. He, he had a, I can't remember exactly what his issues were, but it had surgery several times. It had, you know, several other injuries on top of that. And yeah, performance wasn't getting any better. Um, <laughs> I think partially because he could never really fully heal from yeah. all these other issues he had until finally they just kind of sent him off to the guy that was like, he somehow, he fixes all the stuff that, no one else can manage to fix. And I think it's because he was taking a more integrated approach. Mm. Interesting. But yeah, it, it is a good podcast. Um, it's a, I definitely recommend it. I remember reading some of that story, I think in the book, um, Build Me Elite that they have. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly. I want to see it was Elbow's shoulder that he may have had issues with. But yeah, it was... It's just kind of interesting how, you know, and I think it was Alan Cosgrove years ago said there's always a pendulum anytime we talk about, you know, and it, it applies outside of fitness, but he was talking specifically fitness, you know, kettlebells are awesome. Kettlebells are garbage. Kettlebells right. are a tool. Like, you, you know, kind of swings right. one way and then it finally settles in on the middle somewhere. And that's kind of what everything does. You know, same with like foam rolling. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, at first foam rolling is amazing. And then it's like, ah, it's garbage. You don't need that crap. And now it's like, yeah, you know, use it for what you need it for. Right. Yeah. If it feels good to do it 20 minutes a week total, then do it 20 minutes a week total. And yep. I think, carry I think on. you know, for, for some folks, it, it's also confusing. And, and you brought it up, Nate, like we say the word mobility. Well, what does that mean? Does foam, you know, and, and people will be like, Oh, I do foam rolling for my mobility. I'm like, no, that's not, that's not your mobility. <laughs> right. 
you need to do some stuff for your joints, you know? Right. You know, we, and, and all the folks we're talking about, you know, the, the quote unquote tactical athlete, our joints are just terrible. You know, yeah. they just a, a constant beating. And it's like, you guys are like, oh, I, I foam roll, but I, I don't feel any more mobile. And I'm like, no, cause you, you got to do some, or I stretched. That's my right. favorite. That's my favorite. I hear from, I, I've been stretching every day. Static stretching ain't, ain't going to help you here, bud. Right. <laughs> you know? No. And again, it comes back to the, the nervous system, right? So whether you do flexibility or you do mobility or you do joint mobility, you, we're all trying to manipulate the nervous system in some way. Um, and I was talking to my buddy Jeff the other day about kind of my priorities when I get back into, let's say I come back from a hard deployment, haven't got a lot of exercise, or let's say I just you know take a week off or whatever. I focus on joint mobility first, typically stand up because I find that's less energy for somebody to expend is if you do the stand up mobility, the, the stuff that I have on, uh, uh, on the app on Wednesdays, and then you can move into some of the ground-based stuff. But I start with the stand up mobility first, and then like some really basic three sets of like 10 hypertrophy bodybuilding old school, just, you know, pump up the muscle type of workout. If you can get that stuff in plus some walking, you're going to be so much further ahead of somebody who's just trying to like put all the things in place and do all the things all at once. Cause they'll burn, you know, by day four, they're just done. And then they'll have another six weeks off, you know, yep. and versus just start walking, you know, get a 20 minute walk in, do some stand up joy mobility and do, you know, some of that really simple, you know, three by 10 hypertrophy stuff, get back in the swing of things for a week or two, and then you can start going hard again. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely for sure. I in um that that reset, I've done that a few times. And I'll do um I'll either do three by ten or the one by twenty stuff. Yep. And and just three times a week, one by twenty. But hit that. I find it interesting that you prefer the standing mobility to start with. Yep. Um I know you talked about it's because of energy, but mm -hmm. can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So I, I, I find just psychologically, if someone's had a long layoff or if they're in a lot of pain, getting down onto the ground to get onto a mat, may be a little bit too much of a push and just doing that stand up stuff. I find that they, that psychologically, it's just a little bit easier from an energy standpoint, just to be able to be like, you know what, I can do this before they even, you know, step into doing it if yeah. there's like oh i gotta get my mat i gotta have a comfortable surface like there's a lot more things going in their head versus yeah i'm just gonna stand here and do my thing and then just be done with it so that makes sense yeah. i yeah, guess I, I guess i come to it from a jaded perspective because i always have a mat and i'm always around sure. I'm, so i'm on a mat all the time so yep i i kind of gravitate to the ground sure. uh, sessions yeah, but I think, yeah, eliminating when even just getting a mat can seem like, oh, like I got to go get like, not yeah. only do I have to get off my butt, I have to walk across the room to get the mat. Right. right? <laughs> like you can just stand up, do some stuff and then carry on. You're like, oh, okay. Like, I guess that's, that's easier. There's, there's another component to, too. it. When one of the biggest struggles I've had in the last couple of deployments is that there's very limited um, space and appropriate ground to do mobility stuff just because like you may have nothing but that gravel and that's your workout surface, you know, like, or concrete, you know, and that's it. So, so a right. lot of times just having, all right, I can stand up. I've got, you know, three feet of space between these two bunks <laughs> and that's all I've got. Like sometimes yeah. I just have to make the mobility work between Cause that's the only flat surface I've got in the entire base, you know, is whatever's between our two bunks and that's it. Um, so sometimes I do the stamina stuff just because it's easier logistically. Um, so there's another component to that too, just depending on your environment. And we got yeah, Ephraim in. Oh man. What's going on? So, uh, we're just been uh, talking about mobility stuff. Um, so, so I don't know if you want to go over your, your experiences so far with some of the mobility and the RPR stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
Uh, just jumping right into it. Um, I have a lot of mobility issues from injuries in the past 20 years in the army. So, uh, jumping right into last, was it last week? Like Tuesday, Wednesday? Um, I think it was Tuesday. Yeah. Um, I saw an immediate improvement in my ability to, um, get right into things without a, uh, a, a large, you know, normal, no, a normal warm up for me is like almost like a mile's worth of cardio or, or full body <laughs> movement. And, you know, the, the old army, you know, neck rotation, shoulder rotation, knee and ankle rotation for, for a while. So in 10 minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sweaty and, and, and ready to go. Um, and I also accredit it, um, to, um, injury prevention, I guess, in, in the sense of, um, I don't know, just, I don't know. I feel more stable, almost like the difference, how I can, I've been telling, telling my kids is the difference between standing fully erect and then lowering your, your base of gravity almost like that's how I feel overall, mm. um, in the, in the sense of, of getting it. So, um, I've been doing the mobility stuff every morning and then doing a, uh, the, um, the RPR stuff, the first mobility, the morning mobility. And then that, uh, the other one that you set me up for usually in the yep. evening before, um, before I go to, uh, go to bed or I, before, before winding down sometimes before dinner. Um, but just like, I, I just finished right now with my, with my daughter, we just did a, um, we've been doing a thing for her with her, um, soccer and everything. So I've just been doing a, a quick workout of the day, just a simple workout of the day, every day. Um, uh, low, low, like farmer's carry stuff. Um, yep. just, you know, functional, um, you know, balance yourself out or create imbalance and, and still work with it and let, let your body, um, adjust to it. So, um, but no, seriously, the starting off with this has definitely already in, in a, not even a week has, has helped me out, um, ankle mobility even. So for the first week, mm. my ankle mobility has been pretty good, um, or even, or increased in what it, what it used to be. So I have a, I have a fair fairly heavy duty posterior tibial tendon tear. Um, so I don't have an arch in my right, my right foot, but so that creates a, a hard, hard, um, bend for me to, to, to do some squats and stuff, but this actually helped, um, the tack fit mobility had some yep. really good, um, ankle stuff for me. And I've been doing that too. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what the next 30 days and a couple of these try, try, uh, what do you, what do you call it? Try, try, try phasic. Uh, I keep wanting to call it the Triassic period workout. So, so um, I mean, dinosaurs and stuff, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's my Stegosaurus workout, guys. So, so no, so, no, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of it. Like, I, I, I purposely don't look at the the week's worth of uh, exercise because I'm I, I like looking like getting surprised. I can't I can't talk myself out of something, <laughs> you know. So so interestingly. Um, it's not on a lot of the, the RPR stuff just because there's not a video out there, um, but I'll, I'll kind of walk you guys through it on audio. Um, it's called the arch reset for RPR. Um, and you can, you can kind of do it right now. Even sitting is, is if you look, let me see if I can get my camera here. Um, so this area right behind the knee, you just take that, that thumb and just start digging in there right in the top of the calf underneath the knee right in there. So that's the arch reset. Okay. It's, was not in the original level one when I did it. Um, but I think now they've added that to the level one. Okay. Um, so that is one that I hit every day. Usually when I'm standing, I just grab my knuckles and I just dig those in there. Um, but that'll help with the arch. That'll help with the calf. That'll help with ankles, all that good stuff in the lower leg. Trying some lights here. One of the things that I've found was uh, pretty interesting. So, on that the the behind the jaw or under the under the um yep. uh, earlobe and yep. then behind your head actually helped my like my glutes and my and and my hamstrings and i i it like i actually noticed my lower back loosening up a little bit um from up up there i didn't i don't all this stuff is voodoo to me man <laughs> <laughs> so so surprisingly unsurprisingly that's actually the glute spot that's crazy yeah yeah so you, you hit that and that's uh yeah it's specifically for the glutes right behind the ear and uh the back of the skull 
<clears throat> yeah, if you guys get a chance, there's um, RPR's now got a uh, an online course. Uh, you can take level one, and now they just added like a day or two ago, level two. Okay. So if, you're, if you're interested in it, level one, I definitely highly recommend. Level two, I haven't gone through yet. Um, I kind of got some exposure just because I, I know the guys kind of close. Um, and then show me some stuff, but yeah, it's definitely cool. When, when you come work for us, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for it and you can go. Cool. <laughs> no, we, we, we definitely, we started spending some serious money on, on these type of things. Um, nice. implement, you know, uh, all that stuff. And I, I looking, looking, we're, we've been trying to start looking at, you know, sending guard members to, uh, mm -hmm. getting, getting more, you know, as we call the master fitness trainers to actually really being a master fitness, you know, advisor and, and helper <laughs> instead of sure. some cat who just does the ACFT grader grading for right. you, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I think part of the army's problem is that they try to go with, this is the standards. And once you're qualified, you're qualified forever. And we'll just keep giving you these certifications. And it's like, eh, the, the industry changes so quickly. I mean, especially when you start looking at, a lot of the stuff that Cal and his, his guys are doing, you know, it's just like his stuff changed over the last year and he's been doing this stuff for 20 years. So it's like, if you stay so, so static with, with certain things, I think it makes it a little less flexible, but it's at least a step in the right direction. Yeah. I, I think I, uh, I think I sent you uh, pictures of it, Nathan, but uh, I was up at our Academy for the state, the statewide police Academy. And I went in to grab a workout in the in the weight room, and they actually had uh, RPR guides up in the weight room. Nice. And I was like, "Huh, that's nice. That's progressive." Very. More I would have expected up there. Um, I never follow got a chance to follow up with them with who was who was leading that effort, but hmm. somebody up there at at the state level is is doing it, and uh, you're seeing them get a little bit more progressive. Um, they're still kind of very CrossFit based, but, um, you, you're seeing some stuff like that come into them now. So nice. So, uh, so Ephraim, since, uh, you haven't been on here before you want to, um, I don't know if you want to cover your background at all. Just going to give everybody a, a quick rundown or do you just run away since you're in your garage? <laughs> No, I'm here. I was trying to throw some stuff. I didn't want anyone to get like nauseous or anything because I was walking around. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So uh, 20 year army guy still in um, enlisted side. Pretty much my career has been in uh, protective services detail, um, all the boring. It's a, just a glorified driver for some overpaid gap um, <laughs> who, who makes all the makes all the policies for us tougher. So um, Right now, I work in Tradoc, and I have teams across. Tradoc is the is our um, our training indoctrination, like basic training, AIT, all the stuff for the for the army, all the um, training schools for the army. So I have teams that are our liaisons for the Army National Guard across um, the United States. So all all training and like basic trainings, AITs, um, uh, regional training institutes, etc. So um, just run those teams and. Uh, have fun on the side. So I do do a little bit of uh, contracting for uh, TNVC and I do that about, um, I don't know, six, six to eight times a year with those guys, um, help them out where I can uh, just based on some, some, uh, some work that I've done before. So just, just applies across the board. But, and how'd you, when did you first start getting into training? Was it in high school, college, army? Um, it was, Really training was, um, army, like my first year in the army. And, um, so prior to that, um, I played just, um, I played soccer from age five all the way to high school and in high school, um, moved up North and it was a lot of bigger players. <laughs> and I was like, man, I, these guys are playing to win. I mean, they they were, they were seriously playing to, uh, you know, if you were a good player, and you need to be off the field. You were going to get off the field there. They were going to make you get off the field. So, right. um, that, uh, so I decided, I was like, man, I, I need my knees for the rest of my life. So I decided to join the army and jump at airplanes. So I don't know if I was thinking right <laughs> 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 around that side, but, um, it was, it was that year, that first year I started really getting into, you know, 
Hey, you want to be a good soldier, uh, get better with training and, and shooting and, and the whole nine, the whole, I guess the whole mindset of it. And, um, just went from there. I had a, um, had an awesome platoon sergeant who, who, uh, pushed us to do a lot of good stuff. And, um, he was shoot. He had, um, I remember the first time I was, a I don't know, two years in the army and, um, Jeff Gonzalez came out to our, to our armory and, uh, he gave us our, like my first, I didn't even know there was people who taught how to shoot outside of the army type stuff. So, um, that's, that was, that was all she wrote from that point on. That's all every, every chance I got, uh, the army paid for it or I paid for it. So. Cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Nick, you had some, uh-huh. You said drinking. <laughs> yeah, I'm just drinking water over here, just trying to stay hydrated. Um, so, um, and from you're talking about like what what you're doing in in trade doc are with the fitness trainer stuff. Are you, what are you guys doing with those folks? Are you your so outside stuff? Yeah, yeah. So um, trade doc is the home where I where I work. Uh, trade doc is the big overarching command and the, the, the organization that work is the center for initial military training. And so what we were the proponent for the new army PT test, the new overview of both soldier fitness, holistic fitness, they call it holistic health and fitness H2F. That's the name of it. And, uh, the more of the soldier athlete, uh, program. And so what they're trying to do are we, uh, make better soldiers from the ground up. If you're better prepared physically, mentally, and with the, the absolute rock solid foundation of skills, you know, shooting, moving, communicate, surviving um, on the battlefield, then you're a you're a better asset. You're less less liability to not only yourself but others and the, the organization. So what we do is we have uh, we we are rebuilding the we had a we had an old program. I mean from even before I was, I was in called the master fitness school. So master fitness trainers, MFTs. And so they became a glorified and Nathan can die. I'm sure he's uh, from back in the day too. Um, We used to have, um, they essentially just ran your PT test. They ran PT, you know, it was, it was all, you had to score a certain, a certain one. You had to run a certain speed in the army running was everything for 40 years. So we're trying to change all of that. And, um, our, our new test is the, the metric for it, but the, the holistic health and fitness is the, is the mindset behind it. So we're sending, I mean, we're doing, we have a whole fitness team where I work and um, we do like pilots for stuff like, Hey, would this work? I mean, we even back in the day, we sent some people to uh, CrossFit level one and two. Was that, was it worth it? You know, like, ah, no, probably not. <laughs> that was, that was a lot of, that was a lot of uh, cult stuff, but <laughs> we, we uh, but it, it was, it, you don't know until you know, until you don't know. Right. So until you actually try it out. So we've uh, we send guys to seminars and, and, and everything just to see what would be the best thing for it. And they return back like, Hey, this looks like a good. And so it's like groundwork. If this is good, we get the science behind it. We get the, get the methodology and everything. And we, we push it into our programs. So, you know, the, the army has, put i want to say it's like 2.1 billion now into it uh the the entire program and that includes new installations so uh, new gyms and so gyms are now gone away from the whole sports um basketball (laughs) court to a, a functional fitness and more of a a sports trainer side like the professional sports training gyms like we have um because those are that that institutions have you know colleges um, all, all of those, um, all those places, because they found that we're very far behind the power curve, um, on that. And so we've implemented a whole bunch of that stuff into basic training. So soldiers now are getting a better, uh, baseline of fitness right from the gate. So they're learning, they're learning, um, more, um, wise behind things and pushing, pushing that so that they're, they are now, you know, the, the new guys on it. So we have a lot of pushback with the new PT test and everything and new, new ways of doing things, but it's not from the new guys. Cause that's all they know. It's all the old dogs like myself, my peers who are all like, Oh, you can't do this. You can't. It's like, man, you're just being, 
being broken lazy isn't an excuse, you know. I mean, we still, if you're getting paid for it, you're you, you're still in the army. Uncle Sugar's still paying you. It's not green welfare. Yep. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see the pushback in the new ACFT, and I I still think it's a little outdated already. Um, probably it's it probably came from the 2010 time frame. It would yep. have been pretty advanced. Um, but at the same time, it's just like we've got to eventually evolve. And this is, this is the stepping stone. Like Mm -hmm. if you suck at it, like you just suck athletically, like, (laughs) you know, like, like I maxed the ball throw, just messing around. Like it wasn't that hard. And there's some of that stuff where it's just like, it's, if you have a general level of athleticism, you're good. Yep. No, it it is. So to pass the ACFT, I think is easier than passing the, the the previous pt test you know the it's easy even a six six uh six event pt test is is easier at the baseline to just pass than the, th- the old three is uh, or was but all those i mean even the I, I i love the the one that gets the most hate right now is the leg tuck um yep. and i understand why people are are hating on it because uh, a lot of people I and mean, i and I, I say this, but it, it's almost a, there's a lot of people don't climb anymore. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of people don't do a lot of off ground stuff, you know, on ground or running. They just hit the, hit the track and, and run, right? Oh, I'm good fitness. I can, I can do two miles in 13 minutes, but they don't take that, that motion of moving their own body weight up off the ground against gravity, if you would. And they're, I, the leg ducks aren't hard. Like they, they really aren't. Um, and, and to pass it, you just need to do one, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really funny to, to see people who are just either struggle bus on it because one, they haven't even changed that. I, I, a lot of times I've also said, and, and females were the, were the biggest, um, I, I guess the biggest problem at first with, with the leg tuck and I found a lot of females. So a leg tuck is hanging, uh, dead hanging on a bar. So imagine a bar right here, hanging from a dead hang bar. And pulling your body to to your arms, pulling your arms like a half pull up, if you would, and raising both knees to your elbows um, or your thighs to your elbows, both both at a time. So just a crunch in the air back down. So you just need to do one of those to pass. So females could do this part alone or this part alone, but they couldn't put it together. And it wasn't a strength thing. It was a it was a neural pathway thing that they couldn't. Yeah, they couldn't put it together in their brain because they've never done that before in their in their brain. So it was once we got over that and figured out like, hey, look, this is how we train for that. You got to make this pathway. They were passing. And that's and that's what they're doing in basic training. I mean, we have almost zero failures of of this. And right now it's not a it's not a graduation requirement. But right now, like soldiers, if you get them right away and train them the right way for it, they're passing. It's. It's not, it's again, just like you said, it's not a hard test to pass. It's a hard test to max like a 600. Sure. I'm not there yet. Um, Legit. I think I get there before, before I, I get out of the army, but um, the run and the standing power throw, I, I just need to work on those a little more. Yeah. And I, I think one of the other, the other pushback things is that a lot of these older guys and probably the younger guys too, is they don't understand the difference between an indicator exercise and sports specific exercise. So they're like, I'll never throw a ball. Like, that's not the point. The point is, can you express power? That's it. There's nothing right. else. Yep. It's not, can you throw a ammo can onto a truck? It's, can you <laughs> express power? Period. It is. It is. It's a very, it's a very, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of wild when you really think about it because it's a, it's an explosive thing. Some, you're watching some people the first time when they're, you know, they've never done it before, right? And they just do it. They, they're using either, way too much upper and arms and and like no legs or they're just using their legs or they're hinging it's just like look man that that ball needs to go that way so how do we do that we <laughs> stack we stack all the the muscu- muscular and skeletal as much as we can behind that ball to get it there <laughs> like 45 yep. degrees that's where we're going we're going to the moon push it so what are you going to use you, you use it all and it's just it's just that it's that you know that neural pathway building that's and yep. so that's why again um just the simple stuff that uh you know the the warm-ups and stuff that we have activates so much of that um that it's it's i I don't know it's good it prepares your body to to utilize that type of explosive power 
as needed, you know, like on command, like I need explosive power without, you know, with, <laughs> that, that, that type of stuff, again, creates your brain to be able to do that, you know, um, when, when you need the to. RPR. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now, now kind of speak and, and time that in, Mick, have you used RPR before shift? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I use it almost every morning before shift. So usually like on, on the app, I pay one RPR for the day. That's the RPR. Um, uh, I do, um, I usually in the morning, right as I'm getting dressed, I'm, I'm hitting RPR. Um, and actually I'm getting ready to get with my, uh, my SWAT dudes and like, Hey, you guys start trying to do this before call outs, like before yeah. you put on all the gear, like try this. Um, and I, my fighters use it before fights, all of that. So yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm, I think like there's been some stuff in the NTOA in the past where they've done like tactical warm ups. like, Hey, you should do a little tactical warm up for these known operations, these search warrants, et cetera. Sure. Um, um, but I think RPR would be a better way to go with that. It's five minutes. Like dudes can literally do it next to their car, yep. you know, while they're getting their gear out, just boom, 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 and, and go at it. You know, um, you I, could I, even, you could even hit most of it. Like you could definitely hit the sternum, lower ribs, behind the ear, back of the back of the neck. You could hit all that sitting, like on the way yeah. to the call. Yeah, yeah, you could hit it, you know, sitting in the bus or whatever. Um, we we started figuring out that mobility piece a little bit after some really long call outs where we were stuck in like well, like eight dudes in a minivan <laughs> stuck for like a couple hours and then having to jump out. So we even started like just keeping like some bands and, and stuff like that in our ARV and in our, uh, in our, our vans just so guys could do more of the static stuff, but that was pre RPR. Sure. So now I'm, I'm, you know, retired off the team, but I, I still, talk to the guys all the time i'll uh i'm, I'm planning on grabbing me like hey try this see yeah. see what you think with it so it's interesting because i think i'm trying to remember the numbers but cal had something like it was like 1500 hockey hockey practices and not a single soft tissue injury after doing rpr and then same thing with these these high school sprint teams track teams I mean, they're just like, yeah, we don't have a single soft tissue injury. Yeah. You know, we'll have guys break fingers or whatever in football, but that's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, that contact. And uh, Ephraim he bounced off, but like I'm talking about the, the tuck um, that, that goes back to that mobility piece we're talking about too. You know, mm -hmm. it's, we, we, that hanging and crawling and, all of that stuff to open up those shoulders and hips and that mobility piece, a little bit of stuff like RPR and a little bit of uh, some of this tax fit stuff would help. I would think help those kids out a lot because yeah. you know, everybody just quits doing that stuff. Yeah. I actually, uh, down here at school, I'm a team lead. So I've got nine other airmen that are kind of, I'm not in charge of, but I'm responsible for them. That's as I say it. But uh, yeah, uh, last week or so, we had one morning where I went through and did the RPR and one of the tack fit mobility things with them. Just as kind of a like, hey guys, here's a really good tool that you can use. And I sent them all the links to kind of the videos and whatnot. Like start integrating this stuff, like get up out of bed on a Saturday even and just run through this real quick. And by the end of it, all of them are like, yeah, I feel like really good now. I feel like I can go and do it, like actually feel prepared to go do a workout rather than just kind of the normal group warm up thing that we were doing before. Yeah. Nice. You know, it's interesting too, uh, speaking of, of groups is initially in level one. So I went to one of the very first level one courses. There was a lot of emphasis on getting buy-in from the athletes 
but I found that I just show it to people and like, they just follow along with it and they do it. And like the buy-in's already there. And, and maybe that's just because we're older and we're all a little bit more broken <laughs> than some of the right. younger kids. But there's, there's, there's definitely like, as people are, because I think the younger kids, like they don't notice as much. So they're like, yeah, whatever. But I think right. with this, I think with our crowd, they notice stuff almost right away. I mean, like, like Ephraim said, like he, he felt it pretty much immediately. So, yeah. so I think it's a little bit easier with the buy-in thing. Like I, I haven't had any issues with buy-in. I just, you know, like, Hey, do the thing and everybody just does it. Yeah. I, I got buy-in with it in, in my martial arts gym because I was doing it like everybody else was doing the foam roller and I just over here, you know, three minutes. <laughs> right. Like, what's that weird shit you're doing? I'm like, it's RPR. And then the way I, the difference in my mobility moving during rolls and stuff. Now this was also in conjunction with what we were doing in the, in the weight room. Sure. But um, they're like, man, like you're moving completely different. You know, you're moving so much better. Like, and I was like, yeah, I'm telling you, it's, I can tell you, you can sit there and watch the nights that I don't RPR and the nights I RPR and you'll see the difference in the rules. Mm, 100%. 100%. You'll see the mm. difference on, you'll really see the difference on the tie pads and the focus mitts. What the power? Stuff where, where I'm striking. My range of motion is better. My more power. It, that, that ballistic stuff it makes a big, big difference on. Hmm. Um, Interesting. At least that's what I'm seeing in the mat room, anecdotally. So, and again, I usually I zero injuries. Yeah, I get little things here and there. You know, I get the especially with the contact and the hockey stuff. Like, I put my hip out of place. <laughs> it's like, oh man, like an old lady. I gotta gotta go to the dog and have him put the hip back in place. But, um, but yeah, I mean, outside of that, like, I don't really have. A whole lot of issues with with anything um especially when i was doing the full triphasic like i'm able to train at the same level of a d1 athlete like this is nuts at 42 you know being able to train at the same level as somebody half my age yeah i mean being able to to do some of that i talked about that um uh with some of my my folks i was like you know the programming i'm using now like you hear a lot of dudes who will be like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to hit the mat room today. You know, I had a, a big lifting session or I'm not going to do my big lifting session because I want to hit the mat today. And I always tell people, like, when you're training a, a martial art or especially if you're training for an event, like if you got to choose between the mat room or the weight room for 90 percent of, of you, you should be in the mat room. Right. Yep. If you've got to choose. I said, But with programming I'm using now it compliments and like I actually feel worse if I don't on the days that I if I for whatever reason take a week off yep um I my movement on the mat subjectively is is worse than hmm. if I was in a full if I did a triphasic day yep you know or at least do a tack fit or something like that it, it makes a difference. Um, you know, I, I talked about that last time we talked that to me, you got to, you got to remember what the goal is and keep the goal, the goal and main everything thing, main thing. is um, subject to that. If, if it is not getting you closer to the goal, then you shouldn't be doing it, you know? So, but for me, between the RPR, the mobility, and the triphasic uh, programming, I've actually felt better on the days. And I, I'm talking about a short turnaround. Like, sure. I usually get off shift at 1.30, um, get to the weight room, two-ish, hit my weight, to do my, my programming. Um, and then I teach my first jiu-jitsu class at 6 p.m. So... I come back in, hit some BCAAs, maybe hit a meal, do a little bit of mobility stuff, do my admin stuff for the gym. And then I'm, I'm teaching in the last 
50 minutes of that is me training, like yeah. going and, and uh, Friday nights are like our murder session night. Sure. There's, there's no teaching. It's just all comp training. So, and you know, I'm coming out of those sessions feeling better prepared to go do that stuff within a few hours. And I think a lot of that is the mobility and the RPR piece and some of the neuro reset stuff. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because I noticed for me, like I recover so much faster in between sessions, in between days, you know, it's, and that's the big thing with aging is I think the being able to recover faster, if you can, if you can really figure that out, like you just get so much more in and you're able to keep up with the, those younger guys. Yeah. Yeah. Ned, Ned, how old are you? Uh, 34. I'm in the air in the military though. That's old. I'm the old man. That is, that is. No, you, you are right. You are right. Uh, yeah. And that's like me and, uh, uh, Nathan were talking last time me and him chatted was in the EOD prelim course for the air force. Yeah. I was the oldest guy there. I was usually one of the biggest guys there, but I was able to keep up. I was never the fastest, never the absolute strongest, but I was always there. You know, always being able to get through all the workouts and, right. you know, when I could, you could tell, especially the smaller guys, um, we just didn't have like really any muscle mass, probably straight out of high school, maybe ran track so they could run fast and they could do pushups and sit-ups, but throw a 50 pound ruck on them. They were, and they're out yeah. of their element real fast. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think I'm the, the oldest out of, Cause you're 42, Nathan, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I turned 48 in January and you know, that recovery piece, we're talking about over recovering, but yep. well-timed appropriate recovery becomes so important for me and, and monitoring what the workouts do to my body and, and how they affect them is, is important. Again, keeping the goal, the goal, Goal is I want to be able to get to the mat room that night and the next morning I need to be able to hit the shift and be able to roll out of a car, you know, relatively fast. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, so that, that recovery piece comes more about really looking at what the workouts are doing to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then responding to that appropriately. Now, are either you using um, HRV or like a Garmin body battery to, to track some of the stuff? I use, personally use a MegaWave, Morpheus, and uh, I use the body battery on the, the Garmin. Um, uh, I've just got the battery, the body battery on the Garmin. Yep. That Thanks. seems to be... Close-ish. I don't know. Yeah, it's... It's interesting when it'll say, because some of them, like the best feeling gym sessions I've had are when that thing's been like bottomed out and just flatlined mm. by the yeah, time yeah. I get to the gym. But by the time I'm done with my workout, I feel better at the end of it. So I'm not sure. Maybe it's just the calibration of this unit or something like that. But I've, I've, I've noticed sort of the same thing. But Ned, is it, are you saying you feel better or like, objectively your performance was like your numbers in terms of weight were, were better or above what you would have expected for your ba body battery was. Yeah. I think that last point where like, yeah, it says I should be pretty much flatlined, but still able to put up I'm like not performing any worse, you know, right. than you would expect than when it's at like 60 points, like it's already saying you're at 10. Yeah, but I can still walk in and do exactly what I expected to be able to do based off like the previous week yep. from the same yep. kind of workout. So I've had I've had similar experiences um, where um, the the body body battery said that you know I should be completely in the tank, right? But um, I've I've hit those those objective measures that I would, again, same thing, still on track. I didn't right. like blow it out of the water, but, you know, 
maybe I stayed on track with where I was supposed to be in the programming. Um, so that is interesting. I'm experiencing the same thing with it, but hmm. I also think subjectively it aligns with sort of how I will feel before going into that session mm -hmm. or how I feel like mid shift in my work right. day. Like, I'll be like, Oh yeah, I do feel like complete. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm definitely at a seven right now. Right. Yeah. I'm at seven right now. Um, yeah. So, uh, but, um, that, I've, I've noticed the same thing. It's, it's interesting. It almost makes me wonder if it's a little bit of the, cause I'm just new to the Garmin thing since being in this program. So I wonder if it's has to do with the, the RPR and, and, and kind of resetting for that, that short amount of time. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly, by the end of the day, I'm still back to feeling like that. Right. Where that body battery says I am. Yeah, and I, I wonder if it's maybe calibrated conservatively. And if whoever came up with that algorithm, they may still be in that like, oh, no, we need more recovery mindset. So that mm -hmm. maybe subconsciously, like that's programmed into it of like, oh, right. like whatever metrics they're using are saying that you should feel more tired than you are. Yeah. But then I think also, and this is kind of like the old man and the military syndrome of like, well, you say I should feel like crap, but screw you. I'm going to go hard anyways. Right. So, <laughs> you're like, you say I'm at a five, but I'm going to hit it hard. And I'm going to PR from last week just yeah. because you said I can't. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a little bit of that too. There's definitely a little bit of that. It, and so it's far that hasn't bit me in the butt. So the Omega wave, and, and part of this might be why the body battery doesn't quite reflect is that the omega wave breaks down the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And so there might be days where your sympathetic is really good. And so you feel energy, but your parasympathetic is just garbage. And so you may not have as good a readiness, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of nuance, I think, to, to some of the HRV stuff. And, and I don't know that the body battery catches that. The one thing I have noticed, though, is that like, as I get deeper into a, a triphasic cycle is that I will be like tanked out at the end of the day. But if I get good sleep, I'm back to hundred the next day. And to me, like that's a huge recovery indicator more than, mm -hmm. more than anything else. Like I'm not as concerned with the daily body battery so much as how much can I recover during sleep? If, right. If I'm recovering 80 points during sleep, like that's a, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Right. That's huge. Yeah. 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 And I do tend to look at it more in the morning as, yeah, just to kind of see that, like, try to see if I, if I can find it at like an objective measure of, Hey, I think I slept pretty good last night or man, I really slept like crap last night. Let me check this digital thing to see if it cool. verifies my personal feelings about it. Yep. And it's yeah, usually pretty close. I'm, I'm the same way. I, uh, I hit it in the morning, like, you know, it's one of the first things I look at as I'm getting ready is, Hey, what's, what am I looking at for the day? But, um, uh, I, I wonder if it, it isn't some of that, because again, I've had those days where I'm like, man, I, I should feel a lot better than I'm performing here. What's, what's going on? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I haven't tried I, any mega wave stuff. It's it's a little complicated, and sometimes the the measurement doesn't work right. It's kind of a pain in the ass, honestly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but right. but it's definitely much more detailed info. Um, and I do find that you may not like. I go into a session, and I may not, I just may not feel it. I'm like, man, I am not feeling it. But as soon as I hit the RPR stuff, right around the point where I start hitting right above the hip bones, like something turns on, and like I feel the fire of the nervous system kick on, and then I'm good. Huh. Yeah. For me, it's uh, the inner thigh. Mm. When I hit that inner thigh, that I kind of that's when I get that wake up. And that's yeah. the core reset. Yeah. Yeah, the inner thigh, and I've been doing. I don't know if it's 
maybe part of a different thing of the RPR, but like the outside of the thighs as well, kind of like down along the IT band doing the same thing, sort of those chops or kind of like uh, Charlie horse sort of hits, just not real hard, but that's yep. usually once I get to about there, that's when I really start to feel like, Oh, okay, sweet. Like we're prepped. Let's go do this thing. It, it'd be interesting too. Cause I know most of us train alone is that, the one that we miss is the rotation, which is the, uh, you know, you cross your arms over and somebody on the back is just going down mm. the spine. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting to see if that makes a, a huge difference or not. Cause I don't get a hit very often just because I'm usually training by myself. Right. Right. Yeah. I has me thinking of ways I could maybe, cause I was telling Nate about, they've got the, one of those power plate, the, like the vibration, things yeah. do stand on at the gym and now i'm thinking like can i take a racquetball a crossball something like that put that on that plate and then roll around on my back while that's doing its yeah. vibration thing i might try yeah. that out i like weirding the people out at the gym anyway so <laughs> i don't know what that dude's doing but he's wearing a hoodie he's probably gonna go kill somebody <laughs> right Good. do like a a reverse worm on a one of those snow ass <laughs> things. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I do weird stuff at the gym, and you look at, especially like the booty workouts and some of the things that <laughs> the girls do. You're like, what? How, how did somebody even think that that was an okay thing to do? Like, right. Right. I don't know why they're staring at me. Weird. Right. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're laying underneath a Smith machine doing leg presses with it. It's, something's <laughs> off here. Right. The leg press is too manly. <laughs> I guess so. Cool, man. You guys want to talk any, uh, any, about any other stuff on mobility or anything else? I think I'm pretty good, man. Cool. I think I covered a yeah. lot on mobility so yeah i think on um i don't know what do you guys think of the next one do maybe uh four coactives and kind of digging that a little bit more yeah hoping yeah that'd get, be really uh, good yeah. hoping to get Ephraim back on so we can we can dig in that a little bit with him uh i think he'd be a, be a good uh person to bounce that off too right yeah him and duke yeah i think it'd be i really enjoyed his sounds like he's somebody that hasn't trained consistently as like a lot of the rest of us yep. so he you know it's good to hear kind of that newcomer's perspective to a lot of this stuff because it sounds like we've all been fairly consistent at least for the last 10 15 20 years yep. um, doing this kind of thing but it's, it's good to get his take on it as well because there's things that we think are just normal yep. and then you kind of hear his perspective and you're like oh yeah like that actually makes a lot of sense that you know that that's going to make a bigger change Especially in like a leadership position, it's good to have that experience of, of talking to those type of people. So that way you can mm -hmm. implement some of those strategies with, with some of your people that might be newer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's something I've really been struggling with as, you know, because in the military, you're going to get promoted. You're going to move up unless you're just a complete dirtbag. Um, but yeah, you will get put into leadership positions and trying to, yeah, be able to take myself back out. And how do I explain this? So a group of people without the same background it yep. makes sense to them yeah it's it, it's a challenge because like i'm on net i'm on the other end of that where i've been in a leadership role um i guess coming up on 20 years right so like i i sort of forget and, and in the same organization and everything it's like sometimes i have to remind myself Hey, these people haven't been doing this for 20 years. Right. They they don't know that. They they they've not had to think like that yet. And it's it's good to do. It's so yeah, getting getting Duke on here talking about his kind of new guy perspective. Yeah. Would be good. He was uh he was gonna come on tonight, but apparently his wife uh, kidnapped him, so ah. <laughs> made that. <laughs> cool man well uh but yeah let's hook up sometime i guess in the next uh next week or two and we'll we'll do it yeah. again sounds good yeah all right have a good one all right later. see you man laters